Hello, everyone. Welcome. This is Whistlekick, Martial Arts Radio, episode 447. Today, we're talking about finding your own path in the martial arts. And I'm joined by a guest. I'm Jeremy Lesniak, and I'm your host on this show. I'm the founder here at Whistlekick, and I get to spend all day, every day, working on things for traditional martial arts, whether those be products or content. And you can find everything we do at whistlekick.com. There's a store there. And if you pop into the store, you can find all the things that we make. And if you use the code PODCAST15, that's going to get you 15% off every single product with a Whistlekick logo on it. If you want to find out more about this or any other episode of the show, go to whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. We bring you two new shows every single week, all for free, with the goal of connecting, educating, and entertaining traditional martial artists around the world. Today's subject came as the result of an email, a question that our listener, TJ Jones, posed to me. He was struggling, trying to understand some things, so I reached out to Mr. Jones and said, hey, why don't you come on the show? Let's talk about this together. Maybe it'll benefit others. We had a good chat. I hope you enjoy it. So let's do this. Mr. Jones, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Hi, Mr. Wesniak. I am a excited to be part of this. This is going to be fun. Hey, I'm, I'm happy to have you here. And, you know, listeners, we're, we're slowly building up these, these Thursday episodes where somebody comes on to ask a question, which is a heck of a lot of fun for me because, well, one, I don't have to do any research or anything. And two, it gives me an opportunity to engage with somebody on a subject and really just unpack it martial arts wise, which I'm sure you all know I love to do. And you wrote in with a question. I did. And I don't even know if you were planning on it coming this far and becoming something for the show. So thanks. <laughs> thanks for <laughs> your willingness to do that. <laughs> well, you know, I, I had hoped that um, to, to get some feedback from you just because you've, you've had so much, I don't know if it's intentional or not, but you've had quite a bit of input in my, in my uh, I guess, worldview of martial arts training just because of the, the um, podcast and being able to listen to the different people you bring on and, and your um, experience because you've listened and discussed things with so many people. So I was really looking forward to getting your feedback. And if we can maybe help some other, other martial artists who are in the same boat or who have experienced a similar situation, then I'd be, I'm glad to be of help for them. Yeah. Yeah. And this is a topic that I think just about everybody, if you've been training for, we'll say four or five years or more has probably considered. So what, Instead of us, you know, burying the lead on this more, what what was the question? What was it you wanted to talk about? Well, I'm I'm kind of in a quandary right now. Uh, I've been training since I was 14, off and on, uh, different schools, different arts. But what I've kind of decided to do now is try to advance in belt ranks. I've been I've had my first degree for some time, and then I just I transferred to another school, also a Taekwondo school. So both Taekwondo schools, but two different lineages. And um, and went back and started training again and got a second uh, first degree uh, from them from this other school. And so then whenever I asked them, I said, "Okay, you know, look, I want to start advancing toward my second degree and, and continuing to move up." I said, "So, you know, what do you guys have like a curriculum sheet? Do you have you know something that you can give me to kind of tell me what I need to be working on?" And uh, one of the instructors was like, "Well, so you have to know these three forms." But other than that, it's kind of up to you. And I was like, wait a second, what? Uh, it, and he continued to explain. He said, it's, it's going to be more like um, you decide where you want to take your training. And then, you know, whether it be in, in self-defense, you know, more practical stuff or whether you want to do uh, more demo stuff or breaking or weapons, you know, you kind of have to decide what direction you want to go. And then we will test you based on the skills that you gain in that area, I guess. I'm, I'm not really sure how the testing looks at that point, but that's mm-hmm. kind of what he said. And so I'm like, interesting. And and it's not, I, I kind of feel like this was the case with my first school as well. And one of the reasons that I didn't go back and continue training with them after I left to go to college was that there, there didn't seem to be a path forward after you reached your first degree. So Having having seen that in two schools, and then I've heard of it in at least one other school, I, I was kind of like, hmm, I wonder if this is a common thing and maybe something that other people are struggling with. Yeah, and I don't know that I'm going to go so far as to say it's common, but it's certainly not uncommon. Because as you said, with your situation, there are a few forms that you have to learn, but you've probably learned all of the 
basic techniques and the majority of that curriculum outside of forms. In fact, I know plenty of schools where all of the forms are taught ahead of black belt, where even a first degree black belt is simply showing refinement and it becomes that that vague, you know, kind of fuzzy line progress that we're talking about here. I've experienced it in different ways. I, I've been part of schools that have an almost militant curriculum where there are new movements, new techniques, all the way up through into, you know, second, third, fourth, fifth degree black belts. And then I've been with other schools where the forms, there are minimum forms that you have to know, but sometimes if you're really into forms, and, and this was me, you might learn several of them ahead of time. You know, I think when I tested for my black belt, there 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 wasn't anything that I hadn't known form wise for four years wow. at that point. So it really becomes very individualized. And I think that the further away you get from white belt, the more open it becomes. And I don't know if that's accidental or by design, but regardless of the systems I'm thinking of, it does tend to be pretty broad as you get further along. I mean, look at it this way. Can you imagine an eighth degree black belt in some, you know, 10 belt system where they're going through and they're learning some new technique? I mean, that just, (laughs) they're working on things, they're learning, they're getting better. But I, I think for the majority of us, you know, if you consider that situation, there's something that seems a little odd about it. Maybe it does happen. I mean, there's probably some school out there that does, especially if it's a school that promotes people very, very rapidly. But, you know, teach their own, right? Yeah. And, and I guess, like, I, I know that in, in some schools, like, they have you create your own form for your second degree. You know, they, they expect you to be able to have that creativity. And so, like, I'm okay with that. But on the other hand, there's so, the martial arts are so deep that it's like looking into a well and trying to pick out a single drop of water to study. You know what I mean? Uh, you know, I can study, I can study breaking or I can study, you know, pressure point theory, or I can study teaching or demonstration style, for, you know, performance stuff, or, you know, I can do sparring competitions. You know, it's, there's just this massive, uh, repository of knowledge and it's you're kind of standing in the treasure trove and going what do i pick up first right and and the irony is the more time you spend in your training the higher you progress the more you realize there is out there and one of the saddest moments in my life was when i realized that no matter how much time i spent training no matter how good i got no matter how many instructors i had in schools i trained in i wasn't going to know anywhere close to all of it I will die one day having barely scratched the surface of what is available to me as a martial artist. And as someone who loves knowledge and loves to share knowledge and just get better at the things that I'm passionate about, that was pretty depressing. Yeah, I can understand that. I think for me, I, I dim, that it's, it's a little different for me and that, that's exciting to me just because it, there's, there is so much. And, um, to be honest, I kind of, I have to blame you because I didn't realize how much there was until I started listening to your podcast about, I guess it was, I don't know, two and a half years ago, I started listening to your podcast. And of course, like by then you had like, I don't know, a hundred episodes or something. I just binge listened to the whole thing. And then once I finally got caught up, um, I listened to them, you know, I, I stay caught up with you pretty much. I think there's a few episodes that I haven't finished just because, you know, I was, uh, busy with something and, and never went back and finished it. But for the most part, I've, I've listened to pretty much all of them. And, uh, and because of that, I, I had this whole huge, like, Oh, I can go, you know, train with this person or I can go study this thing or, you know, and so it's, it's exciting, but it's also like, ah, yeah. I don't know where to go. <laughs> right. Right. And so it, it becomes, I, I'm, I'm hearing my high school debate coach in my ear, in a sense, when, when you look at, something like this, it comes down to a question of value and what is most valuable to you. If the school is offering you these very open parameters to just get better at something, to progress in some way that I suspect they want it to be something that that matters to you, some, some sort of resonance in there, then you have a near infinite number of ways to proceed. 
So the one that makes the most sense is to figure out what is going to be most valuable to you. And I think that there are two main ways that you can look at that. You can look at it from what am I going to enjoy the most or what is going to help me progress the most. So the enjoyment is likely the thing that you're already the best at or the other side of it, the thing that's going to help you progress the most is the thing that you're the worst at. It's an interesting way to look at that. I, I don't think I would have... I mean, I guess I, I know to you know focus on the things that are hard for you, but I wouldn't have necessarily looked at making the decision that way. If we think about martial arts as being all interrelated, so let's, you know, let's take forms and basics and breaking and sparring and let, let's, let's throw in even tricking, you know, let's throw all those in there as potential options. And then there's still even so much within all of those. If you worked on making your punches stronger, faster, more powerful. That's going to translate into every, everything else. If the thing that you're having the hardest time with is, let's say, having strong, stable stances, the more you work on those, the more it's going to affect everything else. And not equally, of course. But if you really hone in on the fact that everything we do in martial arts is connected to everything else we do in martial arts. You can't help but move the ball forward on everything when you pick something that's kind of core and fundamental or something that is lacking because as you work on that, you're working on all the you know various sub-elements of that thing. Yeah, I, I, I can see that. I can definitely see that that working on each individual thing, it, you know, it's funny, there's two, two separate theories kind of coming out now. And it seems like um, a lot of, I don't want to say younger generation martial artists, but, but kind of the, the mid range, the, the middle age group, they're kind of switching from, you know, do 4,000 punches and it'll make everything else better to more of, Hey, let's spend time focusing on, um, on an, an applicable technique, you know, going back to the bunk and saying, let's not do the form 10,000 times until you know what it means. Whereas you used to do the form 10,000 times and then learn what it meant. Um, which is, I guess it's kind of a pendulum because looking at the history and whatnot, I listen to like Ian Abernathy and some of those guys. And, um, you know, they say it used to be exactly the opposite. You would learn the application and then put it into the form and that's where the form came from. Um, so it's an interesting pendulum that's kind of swinging back and forth. So I, in a way, we, I guess we get caught between do we, do we spend the time on repetition or, or on focusing on one little thing, or do we go and, and try to improve a broader range? Like, you know, if I wanted to improve my competition, um, you know, I would, I would spend most of my time doing sparring drills. Um, and doing doing the the pumse or the kata, and but then if I want to improve my um, applicable skills, then I would maybe go train with somebody who's really good at reality based self defense. Um, or do I just kind of keep doing all of it and and take maybe a slower growth path, but a broader spectrum? And I, I think the most important thing to realize is that there's no wrong answer. One of the things that I've come to realize, uh, you know, I get invited to teach at seminars and, and uh, a number of these groups where there will be a bunch of different people teaching and everybody's got their specialty. You know, there, there's, a, there's a, somebody teaching flexibility and, you know, I'm pretty flexible, but I'm not as flexible as that person or, you know, sparring. And I, I'm a, you know, I'm a decent point fighter and I can, I can coach people through pretty well, but you know, I'm, I'm certainly not great. Um, you know, I'm, I'm pretty good at forms and I can coach people pretty well at forms, but, you know, I'm not going to, you know, getting out there and teaching somebody one of my forms, that doesn't really make sense. And, and so that turns into, well, what, what is the thing that I bring forward that I'm really good at? And it took me some time to, to accept the fact that there isn't anything. but that is the thing that I'm really good at is that I'm very broadly based. 
And what that's meant over the last few years is Whistlekick's created a number of these opportunities is that there's always been something I've been able to pull out of my back pocket that has been new or at least I was able to share in, in, in a way that people learned everywhere I've gone. You know, a couple of weeks ago, I was pulling some Filipino martial arts stuff out of my back pocket, working with a group that had trained almost exclusively with traditional karate. You know, and I'm around people who've been training for, you know, 50, 60 years. I mean, some absolutely wonderful martial arts. And I said, well, here's this little thing. And everybody's eyes just kind of lit up. And I went, oh, okay. And I've had a number of those situations pop up. And it feels really nice to be able to say, well, you know, I've at least dabbled, if not done more than dabbling in a lot of different things. And you start to see, again, how it all interrelates. And that maybe I, you know, as I'm working on Filipino martial arts stuff, it's making my karate better. And then the next time I go in and I'm training in a Taekwondo class, I have an epiphany about how some of that relates. So I'm not saying that you have to or even should take that, you called it a slower approach of being kind of multifunctional, but it's an option and it's not a bad one. You know, that, that resonates with me a lot because I'm kind of like you. I'm not uh, super talented at any one thing. Um, I, I've you know, never been uh, the, the super flexible guy or the, and even, even in non-martial arts realms, I've never been like super good at one thing, but I know a little bit about a lot of things and I'm good at making the connections between them. Um, so maybe, maybe rather than thinking of, you know, I, I need to focus on this one thing. Maybe I, maybe I just pick something knowing that that's going to add to my tool bag. And like you said earlier, it's going to, it's going to start, uh, to improve the other areas as I'm able to make those connections and then, you know, eventually be able to, to help others make similar connections as well. Now, of course, if part of this whole equation is that the people overseeing you at your school want to see something that they're not defining for you, it would be prudent to take a step back, you know, kind of outside of yourself if possible and say, what are they observing? What are they seeing in me that maybe is lacking? What's at least one thing I can work on that they're going to observe and say, ah, he's definitely putting in the time. He's definitely finding his own path. That's a really good point. And I'm, I'm actually writing that down. That's a good, good uh, <laughs> self reflection question. And, um, you know, there, there are like three instructors at this school. And I think, I think I might be able to go to each one of them individually and just say, Hey, what's something that you see that, that I can be better at, um, or that, that you see that I, that I lack or knowledge that I need. Um, and then, you know, I might, if, if two out of three of them say the same thing, or if all three of them say the same thing, then obviously I've got a pretty good direction to go in at that point. And they may give you that information, but if they're like the majority of martial arts instructors I've known, they're not going to want to answer that question. What they would likely be happier answering is you presenting a, a very short plan. This is the thing that I think I need the most work on. I want to balance that out by working on this other thing that, yes, I'm better at it, but I really enjoy. And these two things are going to be the focus of my self uh, training, my solo training over the next few months. Do you think this is a sensible plan? Okay. So kind of, kind of coming to and them it, with, with the, instead of expecting them to, to lay out the motivation, be, be the motivation and, and let them guide the yeah. direction of it a little bit. Yeah. And when you, when you present this to them, Watch their face, not so much what they say, but their face. That's going to tell you whether or not they agree with your assessment. Hmm. Because here's the thing. The longer you spend in martial arts, the more likely an instructor is to let you figure stuff out for yourself. Because the more time you put into learning a lesson, the more valuable that lesson is, the more you're going to remember it. We don't tend to remember things that people do for us. We don't take as much value from those. So I can see, depending on the instructor, they may say, oh, he thinks he's really terrible at stances when over here, you know, it's his, um, all of his punches are terrible. He couldn't punch through, you know, a wet paper bag, but he'll figure that out eventually. I don't mind if he works on his stances. Yeah, sure. Go for it. 
And the other, the other group of people you might ask, if you have anyone of similar rank, someone who's not an instructor, because they're the ones probably mixing it up with you when you're sparring, when you're doing drills, when you're together there, they know you well. They're the ones, you know, you're probably trading shots with. So to know their opinion isn't bad either. That's a good idea. I'm somewhat limited in that area because of the way I had, uh, so a little bit of background. I actually have my own small school that I teach at. And then I do either private lessons or when I, when I'm not teaching, I'll run over and catch a class at this other school. Um, and so most of my training is either just with an instructor or during a test. <laughs> so I don't, I don't have a huge amount of interaction with other uh, martial artists of my rank. Um, but I have a little bit. So that's definitely something next time I can make it over there for a class. Maybe I can get some input from some of the guys there. Um, I say guys, they're guys and girls, but, uh, <laughs> but maybe, maybe get some input from some of the, some of the students there as well. Yeah. Well, I, I didn't know you had your own school. I do. Uh, so my, su- that's cool. My suspicion then kind of similar. The things you teach the most are the things that you're the best at. The things that you avoid teaching, the things that you're not. That is what I see time and again when I, when I visit schools, when I travel around. And, and I can definitely tell you that's true. Because <laughs> I know there are areas <laughs> that I'm like, you know, somebody will say, oh, you know, we want to learn this. And I'm like, work on this first. Because <laughs> I need to go study Do that you mind before sharing I need to you. some of those? Um, uh, weapons are huge. Like uh, most of my students are, are fairly low rank. Um, I haven't been open that long, but um, I was talking to them about things that that they would want to see added to the school eventually. And um, kind of was just going through a list. And whenever I said weapons, all of their eyes lit up. And I was like, oh, maybe I shouldn't have said that because now I got to go do it. <laughs> not that I not that I mind it. I really enjoy weapons training. Um, but it's not something that I've had a lot of experience with. So, um, so yeah, I can, I can definitely see where, where the areas that I'm, that I'm weak in could be the areas I maybe need to focus on more. And I guess that's been another part of my, my quandary is that, um, when you're, when you're looking, when you're running a school as a commercial venture, you have to kind of look at what your students want and then go out and get it but I don't want to spend time going out and get something that isn't going to be the highest possible benefit to them. Um, so, you know, maybe, maybe what if they it benefits reason, you, it benefits them. Okay. How so? If you become a better martial artist, even if it's not going to, let's, let's say, let's say the thing that you're most passionate about or, or the thing that you would end up doing would be breaking. Let's say you go out, you spend a bunch of time breaking. Let's pretend your, your student base is weird and none of them like breaking. In my experience, you know, a good portion tend to like, like breaking. But let's pretend nobody likes breaking. And there are a couple ways that you would handle that. The same way you would handle anything else. You would likely have some element of that which is required. And then there are probably options for them to work on other things instead. You know, if you have sparring in your school, you probably have people who don't enjoy sparring, but they still spar. If your school was all sparring, then you would lose those people. So either the curriculum dictates the student base or the student base dictates the curriculum. I think it makes more sense that you as the instructor are dictating the curriculum, which then dictates the student base. Because otherwise, if the people coming in, you know, if if that mix changes dramatically and you're trying to adapt to that, I think that's really hard to maintain. That's a good perspective. I, I wonder if there's a balance there between, I guess maybe as you, as you get bigger as a school, it's a little bit easier to adapt more to that by, by hiring another instructor who has skills in an area that your students are looking for. Um, but right sure. now it's just me. So I guess maybe I just need to focus on, on keeping those students that, that want what I have to offer, offer and then developing skills that may improve that. If you're having fun, and you're teaching them, and they're learning, and they're having fun, it almost doesn't matter what you're teaching them. All the people that I, all the schools that I've seen, 
where they're saying, you know, my students want to go learn other stuff. It's because they're having fun. I can't think of a single martial arts school I've been part of where I've been having fun and still learning things. And I've said, you know, I'm going to stop training here because it's fun and I'm learning things, but I want to go have fun and learn different things over there. Maybe it happens once in a while, but I don't think that that's, that's generally the case. It's because people don't see the value. And this, this, is, a, this is a rabbit hole we could really dig into. Um, and we sh- if, if we're going to do that, we should do that another time. <laughs> but I want to pull it back to weapons, right? Because I think you just found the magic Venn diagram intersection. Something your students have been asking for, something you enjoy, and something you want to work on more. I don't think you're going to find too many things that check all those boxes. Yeah, that when you put it that way, it, it definitely comes together quite cleanly. So that's definitely a, a direction that I can I can aim in, and um, I guess that's kind of freeing in some ways because it it uh, it eliminates a lot of other possible options, um, and then it also it also narrows your focus. Um, I was listening to somebody the other day and they said clarity and focus are the two things we really need, not necessarily options. One of my favorite drills when I work with mid-level ranks with sparring is I tell them they can, I start to restrict what they can use. Okay, no feet. No, it's just hands. And most of them get better. Yes. And one of the most impressive, and then you say, okay, just your left hand. And you could have someone just using their left hand, sparring against someone who's using both hands and both feet. And they can usually do just fine because they don't have to worry about what hand do I block with? What hand do I punch with? They just have to go. Sometimes having options is not a good thing. It makes it more challenging. And yeah, I I definitely have seen that as well in in students, um, particularly like you get the green belt ranks, you know, and they start to learn some of the fancier kicks and, and they forget about the basics. They don't want to use them anymore, even though that's what's practical and what works. Um, and they start trying to, you know, throw their spin hook kick every time and end up getting kind of creamed because they're not, they're not paying attention to using the basics that like they used to have to. So, um, right. Yeah. That's a, that's a good drill. I've used that one before myself. Tell me about your weapons experience. So I've had a little bit of, um, stick fighting. Um, <laughs> so I've had, I've had some rather creative stick fighting, actually. Um, I first trained with, um, a little bit of fencing, uh, but basically it was, you know, uh, looking up fencing moves in a book and picking up a piece of bamboo and beating the crud out of my buddies with it. Um, <laughs> and I really enjoyed that. And then, um, my mom wouldn't let me purchase martial arts weapons. Uh, so, so I wasn't able to train with any like traditional weaponry, um, for a long time. And then eventually I, um, in college, I had a buddy, well, I say that before that, when I was training, um, for my first stand, uh, one of the requirements was that we learned a little bit of, uh, Junsado, which is, uh, kind of a different name for Kali, uh, slightly different lineage. Um, and so it was short stick fighting, uh, and we learned a bit of that but there wasn't very much of it. It was, it was one of those deals where we had another person there who wasn't the primary instructor, but had had experience in that. And so, you know, every two or three months he would, we would have a class and, and learn a few things. Um, but then I went to, to college and I had, uh, a buddy there who was very much into, uh, Western sword fighting. And so we would build, uh, homemade Chennai and, go out at night where people couldn't laugh at us and beat the crowd out of each other. Um, and that was very enjoyable. <laughs> so, so mostly, mostly, uh, blunt instrument training, training. And, um, I, I really enjoyed this, the short stick work. Uh, it just, it just comes to hand very naturally for me. And I, I think that there's something there. I think if you were to review, refresh and develop a simple curriculum, that may be paired. I don't, I don't know if you have formalized curriculum in, in your school, but a simple curriculum that could, you know, start maybe not day one with your students, but start fairly early and progress them up through. Maybe you add a second stick at some point. Maybe you add 
bow. If you know how to use a single stick, you can you can translate that work to a, a lot of things. You know, basically any of your single handed weapon. Of course, bow is not a single handed weapon, but a knife, a short sword. Um, you know, the, those principles from one weapon tend to translate to other weapons. And I bet if you start digging in, there's more than enough there to keep you busy. And if you're looking for help with specific weapons, there are probably people not too far from you that can help you with certain ones. You know, and, and, if, and if there's something you want to learn and you don't have anybody nearby, you, know, you can certainly reach out to me. I can connect you with people if it's a weapon I don't know. Awesome. I, I think that's the, the beauty of martial arts now is that you don't have to go very far to find what you want because we have, mm. it's not like it used to be back in the you know, 60s and 70s when you had to travel two and a half hours to find a good school. There are, there are fairly high quality schools everywhere these days. So yeah. I, know, I know that there are some good college schools here in the area. So I may, I may end up kind of spending some Saturdays over there and starting to develop those, school, those skills. And a lot of schools, if you tell them, look, this is, this is a hole in my game and I want to get better at it. And yeah, I have a school. And yeah, I'm going to teach some of this stuff. I think a lot of instructors are going to say, oh, cool. Well, let me help you develop that curriculum or let's see how that fits in with what you're teaching. Are there going to be some instructors who you know, get bent out of shape about that? Yeah, but that's not the school for you. Though. The, the school that I've been attending has been very supportive in that. They, you know, I, I've talked to them about different parts of the curriculum and whatnot, um, just in the, in the empty hand stuff. And like, oh, well, you, you can improve that here. Or, or, oh, that looks really good. I'm glad your students are doing that. We actually had a, uh, a little inter-school tournament, um, I guess it was three or four months ago. And um, it was just kind of a fun thing. It was a benefit tournament for St. Jude's or somewhere like that. Uh, and and they, they really seemed to be fairly impressed by, by what my students were doing, but they also had some good suggestions. So um, I've, I've been grateful for their their willingness to be open about that and not be as worried about the competition side between the two schools, you know, as far as, as far as competing for students, um, they're, they're more willing to just help and, and encourage the martial arts community in the area. So what do you think? Do you think this answers the question and gives you a, a place to go? I think it does. I think, um, you know, once, once we kind of took all of the information and put it together, uh, you know, looking at weapons work is going to be, um, a, a pretty good direction for me to go in. And the good thing is I'm looking forward to that. <laughs> I enjoy weapons work. Um, and, and it is a weak point. So it's, it's, it's good that, that, you know, those two questions you asked earlier, you know, what am I going to enjoy the most and what's, what needs the most work? They're kind of both the same thing. So, so putting those together with weapons will definitely help me to focus um, everything together. I hope you keep in touch and make sure you, you let us know what's going on. You know, we can maybe do a follow up on this at some point and let everybody know how it went. I will do that for sure. Yeah. Thank you for being willing to talk through it with me and, and uh, help me find some clarity. I'm having a really good time with these conversational question sort of episodes, but it takes a special guest. It takes someone who's willing to trust, who's willing to be open and have a really honest conversation. Well, I thought Mr. Jones was incredibly open and I really thank him for his trust. So, sir, thank you for listening. Thanks for coming on the show. And I hope to talk to you again soon. If you have a question, if there's something you'd like my help with, reach out. I can help everybody. These inquiries are becoming more and more frequent and we can't do them on every episode, but I can do my best to help you regardless of whether it becomes an episode. So if you want to email me, jeremy at whistlekick.com. Our social media, at Whistlekick, everywhere you can think of. And of course, if you want to show your support for the things that we're doing here, make a purchase. Maybe over at Amazon or at Whistlekick.com. And our Whistlekick.com discount code is PODCAST15. If you'd like to suggest a guest for a Monday episode, there's a form at WhistlekickMartialArtsRadio.com for you to do just that. Thank you for listening. Thank you for your support. And until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day.